Hi, it's Dr. Parikh, and I'm covering the first module of uh, Psych of Women. So I just threw everything for the whole course into the same Google Slides doc. It's linked in Blackboard. I'm going to move this so you can see it, even though it covers my face. So I've actually, this is a little different than what it was in the original videos, but I tried to add uh, sort of the Google Docs that you might want to access the most. So your weekly to-do list which has links to everything you need. Um, there will be links to these other videos, but I just uploaded them, so I haven't linked yet. Uh, the Psych of Women slides, so that will go right to the document that I'm going to use. And then also I have in YouTube, I'm going to build a playlist. It'll definitely have all of my videos, and I think I'll probably, uh, you can see I've added on some of the videos that we watch too, so that if you'd rather just come over to the playlist and let them run through while you're doing, you know, folding laundry or walking on a treadmill or something like that, um, you can feel free to do that. Most of them you don't need to see what's on this. Some of them have images that are important, but a lot of them you might also be able to do while walking or driving, um, although it's data, so it's not the best in the world. But yeah, I try to give you as many options for getting this stuff done as I can. Uh, so uh, these slides, I just kind of throw everything in. And again, I like Google Docs because it really makes it easy for me to add and clarify things. So you might notice that things look a little bit differently when you look at them. Uh, when I write, or when I do these videos, I my intention is that this will be one of the last things you watch. So I'm going to write as if you've already read and watched everything. I keep saying write. I'm going to talk as if you've already read and watched. Uh, it's up to you though, if you find that it's really helpful to watch these first because it changes what you pay attention to as you are reading and watching, I'm comfortable with that, but I'm uh, this is really not at all meant to be a replacement for reading these things. It's meant to be commenting or drawing out what I saw as a couple main points. Um, there's, you know, there's lots in each of these. So there's other main points that I'm not drawing out here. Um, so there's just a little divider for each module to show you where they start. And then I start with kind of what are some of the major themes this week. So first, this week is kind of a microcosm of a lot of things that we'll explore going forward. Um, so it's setting up us up for what we talk about in the future. Uh, we also will talk about gender roles and stereotypes. So we start that idea that runs through. And in this class, there's a little bit of tension. Are we talking about gender or are we talking specifically about women and girls? Um, and I've leaned more toward the women and girls aspect, but I always welcome you to bring up things uh, related to men, boys, people who are gender queer or gender fluid. Uh, and also people who are trans, I define women as including trans women and trans girls, um, but their experiences are not the same. There are differences in how they're treated uh, and what messages there are. Uh, I focus a lot on a historical perspective in the U.S. I know that has been really important to me in understanding how gender affects our experiences because... Growing up as a child, I honestly didn't, in a lot of ways, I didn't see gender that clearly as limiting or affecting me. Um, in some ways I did, but really it's been as I've understood the historical differences, it's made it easier for me to understand the differences that still exist today. Um, we talk a lot, we'll talk a lot about media. There's a lot of, as I said, a lot of imagery that's important in some of the things we watch here. Um, we'll also talk about political autonomy. So. Uh, rights, decision-making, and will also set the stage for intersectionality, which is that idea that, uh, for example, I just mentioned with being a trans woman, it's not just being a sexual minority or a gender minority plus being a woman, it's a different experience. Uh, in the U.S., we talk particularly for racial underrepresented groups, so being a black woman is not just the experience of being black plus the experience of being a woman, um, and it's typically more difficult with less representation. So first off, this is very much a sort of lighter historical view of things that women did not have rights for in 1971. And you'll notice in these slides, I also, again, if it's not your textbook, I link to where it is. I really try to keep links in as many places as I can within reason, um, just to keep things very accessible as you go. And uh, also I've tried to model as often as possible, how do you cite things correctly? So when you look in Blackboard at the everything for the week, you'll see it cited there. And then you'll also see it cited here in these um, slides. So I expect you to use sources and citations in some of your discussion posts and your papers, but I give you, I try to make that as easy as I can for you. I really show you how to cite each one correctly. 
and then there's also the references page which is linked at the end of the excuse me at the end of the syllabus and that tells you how to reference uh, and those are alphabetical divided up by module so you'd go to module one and look for e evan so first, uh, when we get to module seven, keep this, kind of sock this away. Um, Hurtado really talks about how particularly white women, in, and a lot of this is very US based, but about how white women have gotten far enough that we have often grown complacent. I say we because I identify as a white woman. Um, and there's even a lot of mockery of previous feminist waves that, yeah, those bra burners or things like that, that really kind of, Kind of distance ourselves from earlier feminists and mock the idea that feminism was ever important not just that it's important today but often this idea that uh, feminists were always radicals and never didn't really influence much when actually um, we have we as women have radically more rights than we did before um, i think also we have very short generational memories uh, it may be worth asking your parents and especially grandparents or older relatives and mentors about their legal experiences. You know, ask them about some of these things specifically. And you may find that they have a lot of really interesting and meaningful stories that just may never have come up. College courses are a great way to get those family sources, uh, these family stories, especially now that you may be viewed more of an adult than you would have been. And so now, you know, more stories are seen as appropriate to tell you but there may not be a reason to tell you. Um, one thing that's been helpful for me also in understanding, appreciating this historical difference is shows that really depict women's rights in previous times. So I listed a few of the ones that I have enjoyed. Some of them are getting a bit dated now. Um, so Marvelous Mrs. Maisel and Miss Fisher's murder mysteries are both still active. Um, so Miss Fisher is the 1920s in Australia. Marvelous Mrs. Maisel is the 60s, I believe. Um, yeah, I think 60s, 60s or 70s, somewhere around in that range uh, in the U.S., in New York specifically. Then we've got Downton Abbey, which is sort of teens to tw 19 teens to 20s in uh, sort of upper class uh, Britain. Mad Men is 1950s and 60s, uh, maybe into the 70s in uh, the U.S. also based in New York City. Um, so these give little snippets that show in a very kind of brutally honest way. So these are these are all within the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, so they're not produced in that time period. And so part of the intention of the production is to shine a light on these uh, sort of gender differences and power differentials. Feel free to comment on the video. Um, that's another fun thing about YouTube is you can comment directly on these videos and engage with each other there. Or you can also bring it up as somewhere in your discussion. Other shows that sort of illustrate differences in women's rights at different times. Um, another thing that's important to keep in mind is that we are in many ways blinded to our own situation and culture. And I always compare it to my glasses. I am noticing them right now because I'm talking about them. But most of the time as I go through my, you know, as I move through the world, I don't notice that there are frames on my face. Um, but if, if, you, if I draw my attention, I can see them. And so there may be lots of ways that there are power differentials that we just kind of blindly accept. Um, I remember, so this is dating this video a little bit, but uh, last summer watching the Women's Cup, the Women's World Cup, and at the end of it, and I'm not a particular soccer fan, I'm not a particular big sports fan in general, um, but I remember crying at the end of it and just realizing how little I had seen women represented in sports, but more than that, realizing that it had never occurred to me that that was a problem. And I think there are lots of those things that we just kind of accept as the status quo and don't really reflect on what it means about power and value in society. Um, the next one, I Want a Wife, this is, you'll see it referred to at least once, I think a couple times. Uh, it's this, woo, it's from the very first episode, or episode, uh, issue. Issue is the word I wanted. From the very first issue of Ms. Magazine, uh, which uh, even the idea that Ms. used to not be an option for women, that you were, had to be, you know, regardless of your age or profession, you had to be defined as either married or unmarried. Um, even that is just kind of mind-blowing to me. Um, but uh, it gets at 
it really was meant to highlight a lot of the gender disparities. Uh, and it brings up a lot of issues that we still talk about significantly today. The first is the idea of second shift, that even if a woman is working outside the home, there is still this expectation of house care, housework, child care, cooking, cleaning, keeping everything running. Um, there's also this recognition of emotional labor, that women are expected to be supportive, to listen, to manage social relationships, to do a lot of things um, that are not, that are often just kind of unseen. It also talks about co-parenting and the idea of women being expected just to just kind of manage children and take care of children. Um, the idea that if, if I work outside the home, I will arrange for childcare, and if we want to go on a date, I will make a babysitter happen, things like that. Uh, and a lot of this gets at a term that in modern, sort of current language, is discussed as captains of households. So it's not just doing the labor of cooking, it's also keeping track of what ingredients we need, making a menu, cooking it, remembering what everyone's allergic to, what everyone's preference is, how each person likes their food cooked and kind of deciding who gets it cooked their way or trying to manage multiple ways. Um, not just taking a child to a doctor's appointment, but knowing when the child is due for that appointment and actually making that appointment. Um, so there's a lot of labor that goes, uh, that's often goes unnamed and unrecognized, that even as men are participating more and more in households, this labor still uh, tends to fall to women. And I link here, there's an article that we'll read in a couple weeks that really looks deeply at this and how it affects women's relationships. Last one is this overall societal message that men's work matters and women's work supports men's ambitions. Uh, and the example here is that uh, the woman would work to put her spouse through college, back when that was a thing that was affordable, but either way that she would work to support him as he goes for a career, but then sort of once he had a career he wanted, she would then drop out of the workforce and stay home to raise the family. Um, and that that would be, and that that would be the one and only path available, that she would work when she was supposed to work and stay home when she was supposed to stay home, all built around the spouse's, the husband's timeline. Um, and I think in many ways there is still some, there are different, for example, a wife relocating for a husband's job is often treated differently than a husband relocating for a wife's job. Um, so it's seen as more acceptable for a woman to kind of build her career around her spouse's career. And this because as there are more and more pressures to have two incomes in a household and as there are more women going for further education. So not just having, you know, a secretary's job somewhere where it may be fairly easy to find another one. Um, but having skilled jobs that where, you know, you may have to look for six months to a year to find the right fit. Um, and I, as we have in more couples with advanced degrees, um, this becomes more a stickier and stickier situation um, of who, you know, who, who will get priority in choosing a job location or how much will you sacrifice to find a location that works for both of you career-wise. Uh, now we're getting in, and this order, I've tried to kind of pull what seems like the most logical order to present things, but uh, it's fairly flexible how you read them. So this is the first chapter that I'm pulling from the textbook. Uh, so this is looking at media representations of black women, and it's really pulling stereotypes from, you know, over a hundred, starting over a hundred years ago, uh, particularly with black women, you know, in the U.S., it is impossible to separate historical views of black women from slavery. That's how black women got here. Um, and so it's impossible not to go back to that, those perceptions. Um, this chapter, I think, really what clearly illustrates the issues of intersectionality, that uh, there's different areas of power and privilege that layer on each other uh, and that black women experience something very different from either black men or white women. Uh, and some later readings that we have will get into how um, sort of the black men focused on men's issues and the white women focused on white issues. And so when you get these intersectional, these sort of intersections, often the dominant group is not advocating for that person's needs. So there's really no one advocating for this specific group. Both groups kind of assume, well, 
yeah, you're a woman, but you're really black first. And the other group might say, well, you're black, but you're really a woman first. Um, so thinking about how these stereotypes are really rooted originally in slavery, when we think about uh, particularly things around women's sexuality, um, black women were viewed, you know, black women were viewed as breeders and they were also sexual objects. Um, and so those are uncomfortable things to think about. And so one way to cope with it is to sort of create a narrative where a black woman is either asexual, so no sexuality, no threat. Um, and they describe that as being like a mammy figure. So someone who is extremely maternal, extremely unattractive, um, there's this kind of age associated with it. There's a sense of being obese, potentially other issues. So to kind of distance and say, oh no, I would never be motivated to have sex with this person that I have complete control over. And also if this person gives birth, I have more essentially livestock, but humans. Um, or this person is so hypersexual. So this person is so... Um, so much soliciting sex and just kind of oozes sex that it's not, you know, sort of a she wants it kind of rationale that I don't need to feel guilty about having sex with this person because based on who she is, she just wants sex all the time. So we get these sort of polar opposites that both address this issue of this very uncomfortable issue of forced sex. And it, you know, it can often be hard to really wrap our head around how things that happen, you know, over a hundred years ago can affect today. But the question is, where would it stop? What would suddenly make it stop? And it does change and shift over time, um, but it doesn't fully go away, even if the original setting doesn't stop. Uh, it's also important to recognize this history of uh, particularly in slavery, but moving forward, rape is racial terrorism. And this is true, not just in the U.S., but in many, you know, in a lot of places and times, raping women has been a way of creating terror within a community and dehumanizing a community. Um, so when we think about things like Mammy and other sexual, the sexual, the sexuality of black women stereotypes, it's really important to think about how it's coming out of that original conflict of um, sort of asexual versus hypersexual. Uh, the chapter also talks about how there are, as more recent images have emerged, for example, the strong black women, um, even that has some drawbacks. There's a lot of pressure there and there's still a lot of control and still sort of a sense that there's only a certain acceptable way to be instead of showing a range of characters, motivations, and personalities. Um, there's also the angry black women, woman, uh, and that stereotype, you know, part of what it serves to do is to dismiss w women. Uh, so say, well, you're just angry because that's who you are, not because this situation is actually inappropriate. Um, and it's, it's tough. I, I watch a lot of children's programming right now. I'm at that stage of my life. Uh, my kid particularly likes Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, and in many ways this show really does strive to show diversity, acceptance, uh, there's a lot of focus on social and emotional skills, um, but they have a black child, a female black child, Miss Elena, and Miss El I'm very sensitive to times when Miss Elena is portrayed as being mad or too loud or too just kind of big and powerful. Um, and I'm not super comfortable with that. I'm also not super comfortable because she has a dark skinned father and a light skinned mother, but her skin tone is exactly the same as her father's. But I'm also the parent of a kid with two parents with very different skin tones. So I may be, I am very attuned to some of those details. The next one, this one is from Teen Vogue. It's in some ways lighter, but it also addresses some very real issues. Uh, it talks a little bit about the history of black characters. When we think about Mammy, we think that really is coming from this sort of vaudeville stage tropes where there are these stock characters. So you might be a traveling band, but you have these characters and stereotypes that your audience would still be familiar with. And so uh, it gives some nice background to that and how uh, sort of the history of blackface and why it's so 
uncomfortable and inappropriate. Um, they talk about learning how to self-monitor and notice, so becoming aware. Um, and for me, that it, you know, when I first had this pointed out to me, this issue that a lot of GIF reactions or other things uh, or memes focus on dark-skinned individuals, um, and particularly black women, it's, um, it was challenging for me. Because my, you know, your gut reaction to anything is, but I like using, you know, I, I don't want to have to filter out a whole subsection of GIFs. Um, but it's important to take time to monitor and think about it. And I'm a lot more careful noticing the GIFs that I use, the responses I use, the memes I use, and thinking about what's the joke here? Who is the punchline here? And if this is interesting to you, there's a lot more articles you can find um, I almost assigned one of the articles that's linked here in the Jackson article, but I just had to set limits somewhere or I could way overfill this course. Um, it also just for me brings up an interesting issue, things that, you know, we may not have had to think about before. But when you're communicating with someone who identifies with a different skin tone than you do, which emojis do you use? And again, I'm in a partnership with someone who has a different skin tone than me. And so uh, with him, usually if I'm, you know, referring like, oh, you're going to be praying for this to happen, I'll use the, the gender and skin tone that he would use. But when I'm communicating with someone I don't know as well, that feels less comfortable to me to sort of put that on them. Um, there's also a whole subculture of digital blackface on social media, particularly like black sense on, in videos. So people pretend doing very bad versions of... Uh, African-American dialects in social media and it's very, very icky. And again, if that's something that you're interested in learning more about, there's a lot of resources to do that. Uh, this is another chapter from the book, What Are You? Um, and just to take a moment and think about how dehumanizing that is to start with, what are you? Understanding and coping with microaggressions. Um, I'm in a world where I hear the term microaggressions a lot, so it's you know, for me, it feels like it's kind of crossed over from being a technical term, uh, like a professional term into being an everybody term. But I genuinely don't know if that's true. I don't know how common this is outside of the field of psychology. Um, and the person gives the example, I think this might be directly from the chapter, the way in which you spoke is not what I had expected based on the way you look. Um, and the person typically means that either as a neutral statement or often a compliment, um, but we don't typically point out the obvious. So to say you speak very well versus, or I'm sorry, that quote was the author sort of stating the unstated. That when you say you speak very well, what you mean is you speak better than I expected you to based only on what I can see in front of you. And I give the example of, you know, you never say, oh, you have two eyes. That's a really nice look. Those two eyes, they just balance each other great because that's the typical expectation. And so if you comment, uh, you know, think about when you're complimenting someone, you are essentially saying this is beyond what I would expect. Uh, and the chapter breaks down different types of microaggressions, some of which are intentional, some of them are not. Um, and Almond talks about focusing on the microaggress E, so the person experiencing the microaggression, to think about the mental and physical health effects and how to cope with this. Uh, typically, it's not just a once or twice thing, it's this constant slog of people doubting your abilities or being surprised that you're a competent person. Um, and I think Almond gives some really nice examples from her life about that. And also thinking about how to advocate. And in psychology, we often talk about advocacy, not just because, you know, you have your personal beliefs and your professional beliefs. There may be things that you support or don't support personally, but professionally, your focus is on health, mental health and well-being. And so that in itself justifies a call for advocacy for underrepresented groups who experience discrimination, microaggressions, things like that. Uh, next, we start our TED Talks. There's a lot of TED Talks that I use here. Um, they're, they're kind of this borderline between scholarly and casual, so they work really well for a lot of the tone that I want to set for this class. Um, so this is We Should All Be Feminists. Um, you'll notice for a lot of these, it's, uh, it's not for videos. It's frequently not the author that gets cited because you cite uh, the video 
the the uh goodness so you cite uh the person who post the account where it got posted um Okay, that's it. Uh, but she talks about identifying as feminist um, and talks about kind of what it means to be feminist. Um, so it, as you watch, I hope you thought a little bit about your identity as a feminist, if there are things that you feel are kind of guilty pleasures as a feminist. And uh, for example, you can be feminist and also like high heels and lipstick and things like that. Um, and also how it feels to label boys and men as feminists and what that looks like. Um, she talks about sources of power. She talks about money, physical force, intellectual creativity, um, and kind of comes back to money again. Uh, and she also talks about how feminism, feminism helps all genders. Um, she talks about women being viewed within her culture as inherently guilty or shameful, and men being pressured to be hard and strong. And so when we think about gender roles, women often are in a position of lower power within a culture, but gender, rigid gender roles affect both men and women. Um, at the same time, I also noticed that she was still uh, sort of as justifying that feminism is okay. She's using details like her very masculine brother. Um, and I, I don't know that I would say that that's inappropriate or wrong, but I think it's important to notice that even as she's talking about how important feminism is, she's also, you know, think about what her motivation is in describing her brother as her very masculine brother. What, you know, what was important either to her or she perceived it was important to the audience she was presenting to, to emphasize that he could be feminist and also very masculine. So kind of acknowledging that there's a perception that those are two opposite things that you wouldn't normally put together. Um, and you'll notice later, I know at least in, I think it's in the very last week or one of the last weeks, uh, one of the authors in our book talks specifically about this talk, uh, as she talks about how feminism has become so broad that there may not be as much of a call for action. So again, that sense of complacency. Uh, the next couple of videos are snippets of documentaries. So they're kind of trailers for documentaries. Um, this one focuses on visual representation of ads. And one thing I noticed for myself is that they were very jarring in the context of this video. But I wonder if I would, you know, if I saw somebody flipping through a fashion magazine and these images were there, I don't know if I would notice it. I, I would like to think that I would, but it's hard for me to say. Uh, the Mask You Live In is another, uh, it's another, documentary that we're just watching the trailer for uh, and this presents sort of a more male perspective. Most of the course the course is labeled as psych of women and so for the most part I focused on specifically gendered experiences of women rather than gender as a broader construct um, but I thought this was a really valuable piece to, to again show how these gendered norms don't just affect women they also affect men in very potentially harmful ways um, and the these male gender ideals really lend themselves to aggression and violence too. Um, and to think about how children experience gendered messages in so many contexts. The video gives a lot of examples. I've already mentioned children's programming and how even in very, you know, warm, fuzzy, hippie, lovey-dovey children's programming, there's still a lot of gendered messages. Um, and some of the stuff from next week will talk, uh, one of the podcasts talks specifically about children's programming. Uh, and they don't name Sesame Street, but it's clearly Sesame Street. Uh, and as I've watched, again, I've been watching a lot of children's programming lately, uh, and they have introduced a lot of newer characters trying to be more inclusive of both boys and girls. Um, but there's still, I think, potentially a lot of gendered norms there. And then obviously there's advertisements. Uh, the video also talks about a lot of peer interactions, teacher, coach, parent interactions, a lot of things that influence uh, how, in this case, boys, but girls and boys, experience and think about gender. 
Uh, and this talks about, so it talks about the same, I think it's the same one from two videos ago, this killing us softly, but it's dangerous ways ads see women. So it's, it's a deeper um, talk about this issue. You'll see some of the same ads pictured, but I think, um, I think both videos are valuable. Um, she also talks about how it changes over time uh, and talks more about ads about men. So really looks at both of those. Uh, and it's funny, we bought a house last year. And so my husband has been um, by needing more tools because he's trying to work on the house and do different things. And we just have the space for it now. And he told me recently, uh, so apparently there's this whole like subculture online about tools and like review sites devoted to tools and people who make videos about tools. Um, and so he's gone down this rabbit hole and he was saying like, it's really fun to buy tools because they work really hard to make you feel super good about being manly and using tools. And he said, you know, and these ads have these, you know, it'll just be an arm, but it'll be a really, really muscular arm. And so uh, it's not just, you know, again, this class, I mostly focus on women because that's how the course description is written. But a lot of this does have a counterpart for men. And I open that up for you to, to explore. Um, and it talks about the sexualization of even young girls, which we'll talk about more next week. That. Uh, so what did I leave out? This week is a very broad, fast look. Um, so things like we're not watching full documentaries, we're watching little snippets. Um, in some ways, I'm kind of throwing you in the deep end on some of these concepts. And hopefully by the end of the semester, uh, you'll feel more grounded in what they are. We don't have a traditional textbook. I like a lot about that approach, but it means that we are not getting that broad foundation and you're not having these words introduced as if it's the first time. Uh, the readings that we're doing are all kind of assuming that you have some working knowledge. Um, so for each of them, I really encourage you to, as you go through, do your best to read and understand, but also um, know that you might not fully get all of it at first and you might need to reread it or later things might kind of click into place for you. Um, and then again, feel free to use the comment section to tell me and your other students what's left out. What did I miss? Because we're all limited by the frames of how we view the world. And so I have my experience. I've done a lot to try to broaden that experience, but I'm still limited by the body I've lived in and the world I've moved in. Uh, so there may be experiences you have or have become aware of that I just have no awareness of, or there might be things that I just didn't think of or didn't connect or that I'm going to cover later, but sure, we can talk about here too. I think that's it. Yep, that's all I wanted for today. Um, and again, this week is a very sort of broad exposure to the concepts that we're going to keep talking about as we go week by week. A lot of these, there's a lot of overlap in concepts, but I've tried to divide it up as best I can into different pieces. Um, yeah, so that's our first week. Thanks. Bye.